Gretchen Schaefer and I'm a city councilor. I'm here on behalf of the city of Bangor and the city council to welcome you. Uh, you want to know that the, want you to know the American Folk Festival is presented free of charge to the public with the generous support of hundreds of sponsors. So please join me in thanking our sponsors including the city of Bangor, the Bangor Daily News, and Chevrolet for helping to make the American Folk Festival come alive in Bangor. The thing that makes a festival work in Bangor is the community support. So you've seen the Bucket Brigade people, please chip in. Uh, and if you have a business or want to provide corporate sponsorship, you can talk to the Folk Festival people about that. But that's how we keep it free, is by community support. So thank you for joining us, and I'd like to welcome Josh Cohn and the World Strings. Thanks. Hi. I like that Josh Cohn the World Strings in that band here. I'm the, the least musical person on this stage by far. Um, anyway, welcome to the uh, World String Session at the American Folk Festival. Thank you so much for your continued support of this event. Uh, there we go, look at that. Um, so, hold on, hold on a second here. All right, we're good now, I think. Anyway, welcome to the uh, World String Session at the American Folk Festival. Who has seen one of these workshops here at the festival before? All right, thank you. So, you know what um, we're just going to take some time to talk a little about um, the artists that we have on stage with us, uh, what their influences were, where they came from, um, what inspires them to play, um, what their repertoire is. Uh, this is called the World Strings Workshop, um, and we are representing a lot of different traditions on the stage. But because it's called World Strings, um, let's start with the, uh, the country of Colombia. Um, right next to me we have the really brilliant, talented uh, Carlos Roja. Please give Carlos uh, a welcome. And joining Carlos, we have uh, Carlos Ron and Pacho. Uh, give other Carlos a uh, so, so, as you can see, um, Carlos plays the harp. And um, I think a lot of people think of the harp as kind of this delicate, plaintive instrument, perhaps uh, plucked by cherubs as they're whispering sweet nothings to lovers. Um, but when the harp was brought to Latin America um, in indigenous um, and in regional hands, it really evolved and took on its own sound and its own spirit. Um, and in the music that Carlos plays, um, the music of the plains of Colombia and Venezuela, it's this meaty and assertive sound. Um, before we get into it, I'm hoping, uh, Carlos, you could just play us a, a quick tune that shows off kind of like the aggressive nature of this music. The Llanera literally translates, as my understanding, to plains, correct? Yeah. Um, and um, this is an area that covers um, the border of Venezuela and Colombia. And so I was hoping maybe you could describe to the audience what um, the geography is there, what it looks like, what it feels like. Excuse my English, please. But I'll try to, to say how is, how, how is our region in Colombia and in Venezuela. It's vast plains, savannas. And uh, we usually work uh, with the with the cattle. Um, has of course uh, many rivers, a great river named Orinoco River, and, and other little uh, rivers, not, not so little, really great rivers also, that uh, goes to the to the Orinoco River. That is the, the the great river of the region. And we are like cowboys, South American cowboys. And this music is cowboy music, really. Uh, really close to the, to the country music, for example. I'm not sure, but maybe. Huh? 
So this is cowboy music in Colombia and the instruments originally were related to, to that kind of, of tradition. Uh, in the past, for example, the, the strings of the harp were made of uh, um, strips or cow leather, for example. Uh, one of the things that can show to you that our music is really connected with the, tra with the tradition uh, of the cowboys in South America. Um, yeah, you can applaud that. That's great. <laughs> Um, and there's this really fascinating interplay, this conversation that happens between the harp and the quattro. Um, to me, there's like a syncopation that's happening with the harp, almost like a like bluegrass banjo or something. Um, what, it, what is the relationship that goes on there? The, the, the quattro is, is, is the a little guitar that always has accompanied the harp. And uh, the harp gives the melody, but the quattro has the rhythmic and harmonic bass to all of the music. We can show in the in the last uh, song we we, we perform it uh, uh, slowly. It will be like uh, some some like something. over the harmony that the quattro provides. Very simple harmony, very almost medieval, almost medieval harmonies. And uh, the harp just uh, do melodies connected with that uh, kind of harmony. Obviously, with more uh, freedom for improvis improvisation also. For example, fingernails um, there it's it's kind of crazy to be this close and seeing them they're like the stuff of nightmares they're amazing uh, but use all five fingers right on both hands to pluck the harp yes I need the fingernail because uh, the bright of, of the of, of the music uh, needs uh, to be performed with fingernails because if the, if the strings are played without fingernails it sounds like this one but with the fingers and nails is... And that bright is really important in this kind of music. Thanks, and Carlos. Um, I've, I've known Carlos for many, many years, um, and I've always been, I've been inspired by your playing, and it's so nice to be able to sit next to you um, and see the, um, 
the, uh, the, the look that you get on your face when you play is, um, it's of like intense concentration, but also of like uh, sheer joy. It's really a lovely thing. I've never been this close, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm actually gonna bounce around the stage a little bit, so um, I wanna move all, uh, to the middle of the stage here to the Campbell Brothers. So we have uh, Derek, Phil, and Chuck Campbell of the Campbell Brothers. So, um, we're going to start with, uh, with Chuck Campbell here, um, and Chuck is also playing an instrument that maybe um, is uh, set in a different context than you might be normal, used to seeing it. Um, he plays the pedal steel guitar, um, and, uh, and, and Derek here plays the uh, straight steel or lap steel steel guitar. These are instruments maybe you, you're more normally used to seeing at like a, a honky tonk or country show, or maybe like a Hawaiian luau, right? Um, and possibly not in the gospel tradition, although um, these instruments have been part of the gospel traditions for decades now. Um, and Chuck here uh, is an absolute master of the pedal steel guitar, um, so much so that um, a number of years ago our country awarded him a National Heritage Fellowship, which is the highest honor of the <laughs> uh, And also a question for you guys, but Chuck, maybe uh, you could just play a quick example of what, uh, what your music sounds like on the pedal steel. complex uh, piece of uh, industrial engineering you have in front of you. Um, it's a, uh, you and I have talked about it before, um, setting up a pedal steel guitar is like, you're like programming it. Correct, correct. Um, and you have, you have knee levers and you have foot pedals. You can do a lot of different things in a very short space. Yeah, so we have the foot pedals that do cry. And the knee levers do the same thing. The knee levers, can you hear me now? Okay, the pedals do change the tones, and the knee levers change, so you can use them together. Because you're using a bar, you can't, you can't finger the chords, but this allows me to do the chords. But the pedal still actually incorporates every kind of slide, lap, <laughs> instrument that there is because it allows me to go between, I can do different tunings, so I can do a vastipool, or I can do a dobro tuning, or I can do a Hawaiian tuning, I can do swing, regular country. Before we play that, I was going to be like, 
I wonder if you could hear the Hawaiian and the country too, the sounds that you're playing, but obviously it's all in there. Yes. Um, so the family grew up in Rochester, New York, and I, I'm curious about um, how, uh, how the steel guitar found its way into the House of God Church. Well, this guy, um, back in the 30s, Willie Eason, heard a Hawaiian player playing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, playing Hawaiian music on the radio. He called the radio station, well, actually, his older brother called the radio station, asked for lessons. He learned how to play the Hawaiian style, but when he brought it to church, it didn't work. His younger <laughs> brother, Willie Eason, was getting his guitar while he was at, while he was at work and learning to play, but he mimicked the voices in the church. And he came to church and started playing when his brother wasn't there, and the church went wow. So they would go and say, oh, when the saints, and then he'll go. And it sounded like them singing. And they called him the talking guitar, and he started going around as an evangelist with the um, revival preachers and everybody in our church learned to play. But the instrument stayed in the house of God, Keith Dominion Pentecostal Church, because they didn't allow us to go outside and play, not only outside at festivals and bars, they didn't allow us to play at other denominations. Oh. <laughs> but now you're here with us at the American Folk Festival. So please yeah. yeah. We appreciate that. I know earlier it was, it was not the pedal steel, it was just the, the straight steel guitar. Just the, just the lap steel. Just the lap steel. Um, and as, as you're talking about it, you really are like, you're singing with the notes. You're res, it's a call and response, it's a singing, you're, you're, you're singing the voices of praise, but with an instrument. Correct. Um, I'm hoping we could hear a tune with the, the three brothers playing together. And it, the other guys can join in with us a little bit too. Cool. Yeah. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Uh, we have uh, Greg Towson and Eddie Angel um, from uh, nearest to furthest um, from uh, Low Street Jackets. Please give it up. Um, we got Eddie's mic on, please. Chip, 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 chip. There we go. Uh, we have uh, these are two of the finest uh, guitar slingers, normally wearing luchadores masks on any stage in Maine right now. Um, 
So, uh, they're definitely, uh, when you played earlier, it was just a screaming hot set here on this stage earlier in the day. Um, and there was, yeah, if you saw it, please put it up I had a couple people come up to me, and they, there was like, there was either people who were like, that was amazing, or like, I don't understand. Um, <laughs> yes. What? Why low straight jackets? That's what we're going for. That, I, I mean, I'm shocked that a group that wears luchadores masks on stage would be go, call, wanting to cause confusion. Um, but, um, but, but the question is like, why, right? Why at a folk festival are we having an instrumental, uh, an instrumental guitar band? I have my reasons. Um, for sure, and I'm happy to talk about them. Um, but I'm wondering um, how you see your music sort of fitting into the overall spectrum of American folk and traditional music. Well, we, I, we think it's, it is folk music. It came from the people, you know, it, came, it was an organic thing, it came out of blues and country music. And so, uh, it just yeah, had to get very successful commercially for a little while. But, and I think what we do, uh, we call it, uh, it's sort of like traditional rock and roll as opposed to rock music, you know, uh -huh. that, that's a different, in our minds, something different. It's an oral tradition, just like any other. It was, this music wasn't written down, uh -huh. um, and so in that sense, it is folk music. I, um, uh, I come from the Baltimore, D.C. area, and where I grew up, um, where I grew up, where I live now, um, you know, we had artists, Link Ray came from there, and Lloyd oh, yeah. Buchanan, and yeah. Danny Gatton, and Bill oh, Kirchian. Um, Bill and, Kirchian knows me. But yeah. Link Ray is a huge one for us. Yeah, right, he, the inventor yeah. of the power chord. He, well, yeah, yeah. So, okay, he played a lot of power chords. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so these are, a lot of these artists are taking in uh, uh, a lot of different sounds that are swirling around the middle part of the century, right? Like jazz, and blues, right. and honky-tonk sounds. And they're filtering it through this, you know, pretty new instrument, right? The electric guitar, yeah. and creating something um, that is, is brand new and um, t totally thrilling without the human voice. Often, right. Um, I'm hoping you can play us a tune, and then we'll talk a little bit more okay. about it. Yeah. All right. So this is a song I wrote. <clears throat> it was actually it was kind of like I had these two songs floating around my head for a while. Then I'm trying to put them together and put a surf beat to it. <laughs> anyway, so. Oh, arrow star. So I have to ask this question. Uh, you play with uh, Mexican wrestling masks on, and uh, sometimes there are burlesque performers on stage with you on yes. occasion. Uh, they are not here with us at the festival, I'm very sorry. Um, and I guess like that aesthetic might be considered like a camp aesthetic, or like, I I'm just curious where, um, how, do those, how does the, your sound and that all fit together? Well, when we, when we first started the band, we wanted to be entertaining, first of all. We wanted to, 
you know, keep people entertained. Be fun. We want it to be fun. We want to be a, kind of an antidote to, to like some other stuff. But anyway, um, so, and we thought, how are we going to keep people's interest just playing guitar and instrumentalists? You know, they're used to watching a singer. So, we saw, so Danny, one of the other guitar players, uh, he used to go to Mexico a lot. He's a big fan of Mexican culture, and he had a big box of these masks. We thought, they look cool, let's put those masks on. And that's, that's all it was to it. Right, you can't take them off. Yeah. Um, can we have you do one more, one more song together? Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, sure. Um, let me see, what are we going to do? I don't know about there's a river. Is that part of it? Okay, well this is an example of, you know, taking a song and arranging it as a guitar instrumental in the way, the same way the Ventures used to do, who are kind of a template for what we're doing. Uh, and it's a, well, let's do it, this bus stop. Two, three, go. You know the Campbell brothers are doing with the slide. You know it's kind of emulating that. So if you. You said about standing up a minute. Yeah, yeah. I want to stand up and show uh, just a few. I have a kind of a signature move that I do. Oh, yeah, I don't want to. I am not getting away with a signature move. Yeah. I, I invented. Yeah. <laughs> so, this, this, you probably wouldn't have asked about this, but this came about since uh, really out of boredom. I was playing Those are most great things. Yeah, I know, right? I was just playing at a VFW hall. Dance one night, and I, I got okay. really I'm bored. And I just went up to anyway. So uh, there's a few different things. I'll try to throw them in. We are moving on to uh, the wonderful Jerron Paxton. Please give Jerron a hand. Jerron has, a, has a, a, a banjo in his hand, but um, Jerron probably plays more instruments than uh, everybody on stage combined, I would think, right? You play, I'm just gonna say that and we'll go with it, all right? <laughs> you, play, <laughs> you play a lot of instruments. And no harp, I don't think. Um, but Jerron, you are... Um, I play the mouth harp. You, oh, there you go. <laughs> Same names, very different instrument. Yeah. Um, but I'm ready for a harp off here. Um, and you are, um, you're a, a, ooh, you're like a, a polymath of a particular provenance. I mean, you're, um, you're. Say what? <laughs> <laughs> Just come up with that. Um, wow. You play, the, no, you, you play the music, and you have a deep knowledge of the music of the 20s and 30s. African American music, stuff that might be now considered blues music. Um, it was marketed as blues or rag, 
or jazz, early jazz music. Okay. Like I said, correct, correct me, please. Well, um, most of that assumption comes from uh, the, what the record industry does. The record industry started recording uh, African Americans on mass in 1920. They found out with uh, the release of the Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith in 1920 that the black audience could buy records on mass. They bought several million copies of that record. And so that ushered in people from the South getting hurt. Uh, people of color mostly, uh, also rural white people. People like Eck Robertson made their first records that same year, 1920. Uh, but there was no country catalog. So the record company in this lovely time of Jim Crow and segregation, where they segregated everything from the army to the record industry, said that all white people from rural areas will play string band music and all black people from rural areas will play the blues. Doesn't matter if you both play the same music, that's what you're gonna have to record for the next 19 years. And we will call this music, since this is music of your race, we will call it race music. Uh, so all blues, in jazz, which did cross over into pop culture because it's exception by the pop people, which is code for white people. Uh, uh, it crossed over, although this was music from the community and from the neighborhood and from, uh, you know, from where it comes from. But uh, there was a set, this music, the music I play comes from a different eras and different times. I play everything from banjo music uh, from before America uh, to banjo music uh, before ragtime to banjo music after ragtime to blues which came after banjo music uh, but which got popular after jazz music. Uh, so it's a lot of different facets that go into the music uh, that comes from the black cultures of the United States. It's vast and it's in lots of areas and it gets spread across many areas. John, um, would you, uh, I want to ask you some more questions about that, but would you just uh, uh, grace us with a, with a tune? All right. I'll play you one of the oldest songs I know from, from a place that is very special to me. My grandmother said that her father played this song. My grandmother's father was a Choctaw Indian. I told this story on the other stage. He was a Choctaw Indian that was escaping his persecution by living amongst black people in Northwest Louisiana. And one of the reasons he got along so well is because he could play the banjo. And here's a song that comes from, oh, I hope you stay there, Mr. Microphone. Here's a song that, it's a melody originates in probably Senegal and Gambia where the banjo comes from. You ain't gonna wanna stay there, are you? My microphone needs a little Viagra. <laughs> It's up now, right? It's up? <laughs> Just gotta rub it a little, make it stop. You're not gonna play for four hours, though. Right? <laughs> They say call a doctor, but if I do, I'm calling everybody. <laughs> it's still up there. <laughs> Have 
I done that caused you to treat me so. You to cause me to weep and you to cause me to moan. You to cause me to lose my own. design or earlier style banjo? This is an 1848 model. This is the banjo in about its original pitch and original setup as it came from Senegal in Gambia. So for people who are maybe familiar more with a more contemporary sounding banjo, it's, it's uh, obviously it doesn't have press. Yeah, something like that. It's, uh, there you go. Thank you. Um, it's got, a, it's got like a, you, you, the, the drone of it, the sort of the melodic elements of it are just, um, are, are, it seems to be a little more present. It's deeper, you can slide up and down the, the fret, a little, the, the neck without the frets, so you can sort of lock into sort of a, a, a little more of a groove in a different way, how about that? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it was a, a really beautiful rendition of that. I, I need to thank you for that, that was wonderful. Thank you, Thank you. So you live in New York. You live in New York City right now. But yeah. you grew up. You grew up in Southern California. Yes. And um, but your family is from Louisiana, and you grew up, as my understanding, in an area that had a lot of Southern transplants around you. Yes. Um, uh, as a part of the Great Migration, folks from Louisiana uh, were terrified of going through Mississippi to get to Chicago and Detroit. So they said, the hell with that. We have a direct rail line to Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles, New Orleans, the state of Louisiana had one of the few direct rail lines to Los Angeles. Anybody who played music from before World War II can tell you getting to LA from any place was a three or four day journey with several train connections. If you came there from Louisiana, you sat on one train and one car the whole way. Um, so since as early as 1908, there had been Creoles, Cajuns, uh, Black Freedmen, and Choctaw Indians in Los Angeles County. Now that's in the early days when people like Freddie Keppert were out there. My family came there 
in 56. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's when Emmett Till got executed and most of our elder people said, well, down here ain't the best waste place to raise a family if we want them to live. Uh, and my grandmother wanted us to live. She wanted us to live good and get fat and unhealthy and have first world problems, you know? About damn time. <laughs> um, and you, when you were growing up, um, uh, surrounded by all those first world problems, um, not all of them. <laughs> we ain't got there yet. <laughs> did, um, so, did you? Were there people playing this music around here? Was it being being played? Because not every home has uh, music. You know, I'm still caught on the Viagra drugs. Um, was was there um, the music that you're playing here with us today, or at the festival? Was some of that? Or, or, were you actually exposed to some of that music in the in the neighborhood or in home? Uh, this is music of tradition, and I'm a part of tradition. You know, everybody has grandparents that have music, and parents, and great-grandparents, and such like that. And that music was the most that appealed to me. Music of anybody's grandparents appealed to me, because it seems like music of that day was designed for the people. It wasn't designed to be sold to the people. It was designed because the people wanted to hear it and that addressed the people's feeling. So that music always meant more to me. And my grandparents, you know, they didn't leave Dixie, Louisiana to start listening to the Beach Boys. You know, they brought every bit of their music out there with them. You know, South Central Los Angeles still today is a place where I could probably stay there and make a living and play nothing but Jimmy Reed songs mm -hmm. and do just fine because that music was out there. I, you know, I was fortunate I didn't have to discover any music. I was born with music in my front door. You know, Lightning Hopkins and uh, Muddy Waters and John Hurt and Sunhouse, Buck mm -hmm. White, Hank Williams, they was all there. Can I, can I ask you uh, to give us one more tune? Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, something on guitar, maybe if you have it up with you. Oh, I can't play the other banjo. I'll oh, play the other banjo. Play the other banjo. Come <laughs> on. This is a banjo more like the one you're used to. Ah, stay there, baby. Oh God. I'll play a song, uh, I usually play music of and from my heritage. Uh, but now I am shifting my heritage towards New York. Anybody who's pretty and can cook, age 18 to 35, 35 <laughs> speaks a few languages music degree from MIT want to help me throw down some roots <laughs> holla at me I'm not very picky here's a song from New York City written for the banjo uh, but the banjoist it was written for Mr. Fred Van Epps didn't care for it too much then the person who wrote it, his piano player, died. Uh, but right before he did, he arranged it for piano, and it became a big hit around the world. If any of you uh, grew up with player pianos in the house, you are liable to have heard this song.
the first, you played both songs very differently. The first song you were using a claw hammer or a drop thumb style, but that it looked like you were uh, using three fingers kind of in a rolling technique. Well, yes, uh, stroke style, so where you play with the top of your hands, which uh, in the community is referred to as rap music, W-R-A-P, which uh -huh. means to knock, which is how you play the banjo, is how the banjo came from Senegal and Gambia to America, played in that style. Uh, people like Pete Seeger uh, came up with words like claw hammer and frailing to describe it, and that's, the, that's what people know nowadays, but they don't realize these words didn't exist until the late 40s, early 50s. Um, the three finger style, which is neither bluegrass nor quote unquote old time, is what they call the guitar style uh, in the 1870s. It got to be in vogue. Uh, it mm, took great prominence and started to develop heavily. And, but by about 1881, it was established as one of the best styles to play this instrument in. You get so much out of the instruments, you get to use all the keys, and you get to play every kind of music on your instrument if you play in that style. Uh, and it was popular from 1881 until Mr. Earl Scruggs ruined everything in 1945. Oh, man. I like Earl Scruggs. Don't get Earl Scruggs was my hero until until I was uh, until a certain age. But <laughs> I love Earl Scruggs. But he. He did some damage. <laughs> Healthy damage. Um, so I want to go back to the Campbell brothers here for a second. I didn't, we didn't get a chance to really meet Phil and Derek. I mean, Phil, you, you, you did talk on the microphone. We've got to thank you for that great joke. Yeah, right. um, uh, but we have uh, Phil Campbell on guitar in the center and uh, Derek Campbell on that here. Um, I was hoping, Derek, sometimes you do some things that really just highlight your playing, kind of the difference between um, how your, your instrument works and uh, the pedal steel. So I was hoping I could cajole you to maybe do a solo piece or a piece that really focuses on the lap steel. feels up for it, they could hop on in if that works for yeah, you. Yeah. What's the best key for everybody? What's the best key? E-ish? E-ish? We're uh, we're an F sharp minor down here. Just, just letting you know.
an A. So, 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 or A flat? He got a harp in A. All right, we got a nerd for a minute, y'all. This, this is what music science looks like. <laughs> no lab coats, we all smell like beer and whiskey. <laughs> 